Gaming Institute podcast. Today, we have at Z-O-M-G Lings, founder of Moonstream.to. Welcome, sir. How are you today? Thank you. I'm doing very well. How are you, Ben? I am extraordinary. Now, I want to jump in and get right to it because we have no time to waste in this life of ours. Um, would love to just get uh, an understanding of your story. Um, who are you? How did you get here? Um, and where are you? Okay. Um, my name is Neeraj Kashyap. I'm originally, you know, before I got into tech and before I got into crypto, uh, I was a mathematician. Um, I sort of got interested in technology. You know, I was doing a lot of like research mathematics, like, you know, the kind of stuff where you don't use a computer, it's like all pen and paper, like all the way. Um, <clears throat> I sort of got interested in technology uh, through an interest in healthcare. Uh, so basically after I finished my PhD, I decided I didn't want to do like, you know, just pure mathematical research anymore. Um, my grandmother was very sick and I wanted to help people like her. So after grad school, I just moved to Japan and started designing algorithms to diagnose diseases like Parkinson's disease and palsies and dementia, like, you know, uh, diseases that um, degenerate your brain. Um, and that's what got me into tech. Uh, I was all I was always sort of interested in crypto, you know, in mathematical circles, like, you know, when the Bitcoin white paper was published, it certainly made the waves. And uh, initially, I was just involved from the point like, you know, I set up like miners on my machine for Bitcoin and Dogecoin and stuff like that. Uh, I wasn't very computer savvy initially. So like, it, it was all a lot of work. And then I just sort of forgot about it. And like, I wasn't mining, I didn't, I didn't, like, keep mining and forget about it. Otherwise, like, we would be having a very different conversation. But like, you know, I just sort of forgot about things. Um, until I'd been working in tech for a while, and uh, Ethereum came about. So I've been involved, you know, building on Ethereum since like 2016, 2017. Uh, starting off on the infrastructure side of things like, uh, you know, running nodes, running miners and stuff like that, um, and gradually moving my way up the stack uh, to developing applications on Ethereum as well. Um, I, you know, around that time, I was working at Google and uh, very quickly realized how like unfriendly towards crypto Google was. At that point, they had the very anti-crypto policy internally. Um, and I decided that, you know, I would much rather be sort of spending my time working on things like crypto where like, you know, people were actually creating the kind of decentralization that I really believed in rather than continuing to work for like a large corporation selling advertising. And so I quit my job at Google, sort of got involved in crypto. First, I worked at a startup uh, called Doc.ai, which sort of combined my interest in healthcare and crypto, but uh, they very quickly like sort of removed, you know, th this was around the time of like the 2017 bubble and then the the crash. And so they, they very like or during the crash, they went like non-crypto. And so uh, I left. I started my own company and that's what that's what we're doing at moonstream um what we're doing at moonstream actually is you know i, I really believe in web3 gaming and i think we're going to go into a go into it a lot more during the rest of the show um but basically at moonstream we're building just open source infrastructure and open source an open source platform for to make it easy for people to build games uh, on on blockchains especially on ethereum compatible blockchains i love that I love that. I love that. So I want to actually jump back a second. Mm -hmm. Something you said was really interesting. A lot of what you said is very interesting. Um, the part that I want to highlight here is the moving, wanting to move away from Google because you were really focused on the decentralization piece. Why is that important to you? And what does that actually mean to you? Because I feel like there's been a lot of um, drifting away from that. And so I'm just really curious, like what part of that really spoke to you? So I've always been a big believer in open source software, and that's probably where, like, you know, my sort of motive towards decentralization comes from is uh, I really don't believe that software should be something that um, corporations control or even necessarily that people control. Um, and this is a matter of belief. You know, I don't think that people who believe differently to me are evil or something like that. But uh, it's just it's just the kind of change that I would like to make in the world is uh, I would like to, you know, the software that I write, I want it to be freely available to other people to use and modify. Um, but even more than that, you know, I've never been really good at understanding sort of like traditional bureaucracies and power structures or, or like at navigating inside those bureaucracies or power structures and like, um, I mean, like, I would say even comically bad at it. I've been like, <laughs> like quite, quite bad at that. Uh, you know, I, I like technology. I like mathematics. Uh, I like games. I love games. I mean, you know, I, I love those kinds of things, but I, I really don't like politics or like, you know, uh, like those kinds of things. Um, and so 
the the not the, I wouldn't say the promise because really like crypto can go in many ways and uh, it could get consolidated in the hands of like you know venture capitalists who just want to like replicate you know the same things we've seen with the internet or with other technologies uh but at least it has the potential to do something different uh you know I wouldn't say that like you know I don't think people should be extreme extremist like you know code is law advocates or something like that because it's like quite difficult, notoriously difficult to sort of encode rules um, in any kind of code, even code that isn't run as strictly as like code on the blockchain, even like a code of laws is very difficult to write and is like always changing and always evolving. Uh, so I, I'm not like a code is law extremist, but um, at least it's a world that I feel more comfortable in. And I see that, you know, for people who are sincerely trying to build and make a difference, um, encoding incentives into you know into a blockchain for those people to like bring real value to like to their communities and their and society and like you know humanity uh, is a really valuable thing and so that that's the potential that like i believe in that that's the potential that made me like not want to work a corporate job for like a mega corporation and instead like you know um, build on the blockchain right i love that and yeah. what's what's cool about that too is I feel like this sort of technology, it gives us the ability to do that and to create yeah. really the, the future that we want to create. So that's, it's exciting that we're in a point in time where that's possible and we have the ability to actually do that in a really yeah. cool and powerful way. So let's, let's jump to the gaming side. Why, why have you loved games? I'm always so curious about this because I know I became a gamer when I was six and I've always just loved I just loved it. Like I loved getting in and feeling like I could do anything and that there were no limits. And that just captured my imagination in a way that pushed me in to learn and to be better and to grow. And it actually shaped a lot of my core values that I still have today. And I'm very grateful for that. So how did you get into gaming? And then at what point did that, did that passion for gaming, however you came about it, um, when did that converge with the crypto side? Um, because that's a powerful inflection point. You know, it's hard to say like why I love games. It's just, I think there are people who love games and there are people who don't see the value in games. And uh, for me, the value in games is like clear and it's palpable. I mean, I've learned so much by playing games. Like, you know, I learned about Japanese history, like medieval Japanese history by playing Shogun Total War, like back in 2001, right? Like I learned about like medieval European history by playing medieval Total War 2 in like, you know, whatever. Um, like, uh, and that's just like just the surface that just only scratches the surface of like what I've learned from games. And the best friends that I've ever made in life, I made by playing games. I made by playing, I play chess, I play Go, I play backgammon. So these aren't video games, but they're like, actual still board games counts. Yeah, still counts yeah. yeah and like the best friends i've made in the world i've made by playing those games like to the extent that like you know i could just i i lived in japan for two years and uh like you know working working closely with a friend of mine that i met playing go like a very good friend of mine that i met playing go or like <laughs> or like you know i used to play backgammon i remember when i moved to japan like uh the guy who taught me backgammon who also became a very good friend of mine said if you're ever in tr trouble in japan i know a guy who like makes a living on the horse races in hong kong and like if you're ever in trouble, <laughs> you can go to hong kong and like you know he'll take care of you like like this is the this is the level of like camaraderie or like you know community that you build by playing games and i don't really know why it is but i haven't found that kind of i, I i've never found like that kind of sense of community or sense of like you know being in it together uh through any other medium and like so I, but you know i've loved games ever since i was a kid and um all kinds of games i mean you know computer games board games like role-playing games dungeons and dragons like this guy i just i just love games and i find that for some reason when you're playing games or when you play a game with a person you actually get a much better sense of understanding of that person than if you're doing like sort of real life activities or you know th this kind of stuff you you see through to the nature of like the other gamers that you're playing with and uh i love that so I mean, many yeah so many things here well, i have yeah. to jump in and i apologize yeah. for interrupting but there's so many so many nuggets here that i love the part of developing really strong bonds with people that you play games with and learning more about who they are yeah i feel like on the bond uh, creating the bond between people side there have been numerous studies, at least th those that I've read, that show that if you have a group of people and you're bringing people together through 
a common goal where they have to work together to achieve that goal, the relationship and trust between them develops in a very strong way. And I think that's what gaming gives as an environment, like a de facto environment for how you operate with each other is like you're on a team. You're yeah. trying to accomplish something in, in co-op mode. And even if it's even if it's um, PvP, you yeah. may have a team that's PvPing against another team, and so you get really close with your team. So that is deeply rooted in psychology. There's been a lot of research to support that, and we feel it, so we know for sure. You know, There's the research, and then there's the actuality that that, right. that happens for sure. As far as learning about other people through playing games, I think about this so much because there are, there are different types of players. There are the people that just want to play for fun and they're not super competitive. Yeah. Then there are the people who are like, they'll try and they're competitive, but it's not everything. But then there are the people and I'm one of these people that Whoa, is just right? yeah. obsessed, yeah. extremely yeah. competitive. Yeah. And you just learn a lot. Like even, even drilling down into that, maybe there's somebody who maybe they're not, they're not going to go and try to beat you directly because they know you're better than them that way. But maybe they try to go around and try to get you on a technicality or something. Mm -hmm. You learn a lot about people that way. So I'm, I'm just glad you brought these points up because I feel like they're these are niche things that only gamers will understand. But yeah, yeah, that's right. Super interesting. Yeah, I, I, and that's that's why people identify as gamers. I mean, it's like it's a very meaningful thing actually. Um, and you see this uh, like especially during the pandemic, like you know how many people have more meaningful bonds with people that they played games with online than, than like, you know, the people around them or like, you know, how much, how much better can you relate with people that you play games with frequently than like the people like sort of physically around you? I mean, for me, it's <laughs> like tremendous, the game world that like, you're like, yeah, the game, the games mean a lot more. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so let's talk about the. So it seems like you know deep deep history of games. A lot of a lot of different types of games too. I'm very similar. So at what point did it cross that inter? What was that intersection between crypto and gaming? When did that really happen? Um, and then how did you go from there to where you are now? Um, so that happened for us. Crypto. The intersection of crypto and gaming happened for us sort of in the fall of last year, in fall of 2021. Um, for a long time, actually, even though like I personally uh, was quite heavily involved in crypto, um, the, I was like sort of very hesitant to like, you know, make any sort of commitment uh, where the company was focusing purely on crypto. You know, our technology is based more on like um, our, our technology is about building automated knowledge bases of software, right, uh, which can apply to like many different situations. We're just happening to apply it onto the blockchain and we're building you know, auto we're automatically learning knowledge about games. And then we're using that knowledge to like, you know, feed game mechanics and stuff like this, right? So, uh, but the technology is quite a bit more general purpose. And I was quite hesitant to apply it to crypto just because of how volatile the crypto markets are. You know, I lived through two crashes uh, and I was building through one of them, right? So uh, I understand like how hard that can be on a company. Uh, and, and we're living to another through another one right now. I'm not counting this crash, although this week has been quite good. But yeah, in general, uh, I'm not counting this crash when I say all these things. So, um, but the thing that happened with us was uh, one of our customers, it's a game called Crypto Unicorns on uh, Polygon. Yeah, um, they, they were actually on the show. Oh, okay, okay, nice, nice. So was Aaron the one who was on the show? He sure was, fantastic okay, okay, person. Yeah. So that's great, yeah. So uh, they're, they're our largest customer and Aaron is a good friend of mine as well. So um, they became very successful and they were using our platform, uh, you know, as part of their operations. And so sort of that swept us along, like, you know, 100% into blockchain gaming. Before that, we weren't focused on blockchain gaming. You know, we have customers who are like in hedge funds who are using our API to get data from the blockchain and stuff like that. Um, but the blockchain gaming use cases, like basically that's the point at which we decided to commit because, uh, you know, personally, the potential that I see in blockchain gaming, and I don't think that, I don't think there are really, I think there are very few games that like even hint at this potential right now in crypto. But the exciting thing for me about Web3 gaming and the thing that's really excited me about Web3 gaming ever since the loot project, uh, like token mint last year, because before that, I didn't really, really understand. Okay. So I like very freely admit. I didn't really understand the potential in blockchain gaming until the Loot Project Mint last year. Uh, and then at the Loot Project Mint last year, actually one of my team, uh, one of my teammates said, you know, this thing is happening. I was like, oh, come on, this is a joke. Like, you know, people shouldn't be running games on like on, on blockchains. Like it's ridiculous. Uh, but something about it stuck in my mind. I was like, you know, why, you know, what's going on here basically? And, um, 
And as I thought more and more about the Loot Project, I realized like, you know, what those guys did, it was actually like quite clever, quite, ge I would say genius. I think like, you know, those guys, those guys really did something like quite innovative and uh, they did a lot of work. It might not seem like a lot of work to people, but the, it's at huge. least, probably, yeah, yeah. Because what they did was they built a community of creators, right? So on the one hand, they like created a community of consumers who hold the tokens and who minted the tokens and who are interested in sort of the aesthetic of the loot project, right? That kind of like fantasy game world, like blah, 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 blah. But the really hard work is they created it. They built a community of creators and they said, hey, you know, we're constructing an audience for you uh, who are just ready to consume your content and like, you know, just use these tokens as like a basis for for mechanics in your game world. And if you do use those tokens, then like you automatically have a community of like thousands or tens of thousands of people who are ready, willing, like, you know, who desire to like consume your content. And that's, that's so important because um, that's, those th that sort of community feeling is really like the essence of like a very positive game experience it's one essence of the positive game experience and that's the one that they went after and they went after it very successfully uh so once i once i sort of started thinking about that once i realized that um i really st started like believing myself in the potential of web3 gaming um in terms of like you know immersion in terms of uh equity of upside right like you know if you're if you know, I play a lot of RTS games, right? So I play like a Warcraft 3, Starcraft, Starcraft 2, like, you know, these kinds of games. And uh, the modding communities for those games, like, you know, Blizzard really understands that, like, you know, content that's created by players is really valuable. Um, and so Warcraft 3 had, like, a fantastic, like, you know, modding scene. I mean... Uh, it was incredible. Dota yeah, Dota came out of Warcraft 3, right? Um, Dota came out of it, which then spawned League. League of Legends. They had... They yeah. had I'm waiting for Winter Mall Wars to come back yeah. <laughs> because, oh my God, that was so yeah. fun. That was yeah. unbelievably fun. You had Hero Lime Wars, Lycian. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. But there were so many like little mini yeah. games that were created that then the derivatives of those are some of the top games on the are huge. planet. I mean, right League now. of Legends is like, is it defines esports. Like League of Legends exactly. is like a game that defines esports. Imagine that. Like, no, even in 2010, like when esports was becoming a thing, no one would really have predicted that. And all of it came yeah. out of this like really unassuming, like, you know, Warcraft 3 mod, like an amazing Warcraft 3 mod. But like, you know, who would have thought, right? Who would have thought that that's what that's what Dota would give birth to? And right. So that was even a derivative of a derivative. That's like a second, yeah. a second order yeah. Uh, consequence. Yeah. yeah. Now, the question is, what happened to the guys who made Dota? Right. They, they didn't see all of the upside of like the value that they created. Um, and really fundamentally, it's because the entire system, like, you know, when you create a mod in Warcraft 3, there's no like monetization angle to it, right? Uh, people might buy Warcraft 3 because they want to play your mod, but you're not going to see any of that money as the creator of the mod. I mean, you get street cred, you get like, you know, prestige within the community, but prestige within the community isn't going to put like, put food on your table, right? It's right. not going like, to put money in the bank. Um, and so what's your incentive? Like, you know, how many more people would be creating this kind of content for games if, if like the upside was shared equally with them for creating that content? And I'm not just talking about like game mechanics. I'm not talking about like, you know, building a new game. I'm talking about like creating lore inside a game universe. I'm talking about like making art for the game. Like there's, there's people like, you know, if you go to DeviantArt and like look up your favorite game, you're going to find like a lot of people making like, you know, fan art for that game. Go to like fanfiction.net and people are going to be writing fanfiction about that game. Um, Those people should be able to participate yes. when that is contributing to the success of something. Exactly. They're, they're contributing to the success of the game by being part of the community and by being producers in the community. And if it were possible for them to actually see the upside of that participation imagine the quality of content and if it were possible for them to contribute mechanics to the game if it were possible for possible for them to contribute to like the canon of the game uh, imagine how amazing those game experiences would be i want to play those games and that's why i want to help build those games right now and that's that's sort of like how we came here with moonstream yeah and i think that is going to be the dominant i don't know i don't know exactly how to even describe what we're talking about but almost like the dominant iteration of what um, crypto gaming turns into because there's nothing that can, there's nothing that can compete with that. Like yeah. imagine having one core team trying to build everything versus a core team armed with 
10,000 community members who are just incredibly creative and imaginative and are incentivized to help the core team and to build in conjunction with and then get rewarded when it's successful, not only do they help to also build, but then they're also helping to promote. They want their friends to come in. Their friends recognize who they are, so there are yeah. multiplier effects there. To me, this is a very clear no-brainer for the future of that. Yeah. And I think it's fantastic that you're now building infrastructure to support that. I was actually on a on a Discord call listening in to the early stages of, of Fractal, which is the um, co-founder yeah. of Twitch's. Okay. And so, uh, so he had on the other co-founder of Twitch who is still working with Twitch. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about right now is exactly what he, meaning Emmett, mm -hmm. I believe that was his name, said is the opportunity yeah so the fact that we're talking about this now i mean it should be very clear to people like when all of this comes together and the right group of people come together to put it in in just such a way and they get the right community and the right lore that is going to be an apex predator in this market and we know that this whole market is going to be experiencing a tremendous lift because there's no other alternative to it and yeah. it is the end game. Like the metaverse is the end game. We know that. And this is going to be like the apex predator within the metaverse. So I'm tremendously fascinated by this. Um, I'm curious now, because you're building infrastructure and you're helping to bring this into reality, what sort of, like, what do we need to do? What would need to be true that is not true currently? in order for us to get to that point where there is a dominant player who's very clearly doing this and is going to be going to be moving forward um, and, and showing off, you know, not showing off in like a, in a braggadocious way, but just like showing us the potential of how far they can take this. What would need to be true in order for us to get there? Or are we already there and we're just waiting for the right people to execute? Oh, no, no, we're very far from there, I would say right now. Uh, first of all, I don't think there will end up being one dominant player. You know, this is the beautiful thing about games is that they really showcase the diversity of humanity, first of all. Like, you know, not everybody, like there's no particular, there's no single game that like everybody in the game universally loves, right? Like if you want to see like a long, like a, a long tail distribution, like the, the distribution of like, games by revenue or something is like is a great example of this like there's always space for niche games there's always space for like you know uh sub genres and like you know like uh th there's just there's endless there's so many different preferences when it comes to gameplay that like uh there's room for a lot of people to build like very interesting games uh you know in general and as, and on the blockchain in particular uh but we work with a lot of games and like you know actually our our story has been like sort of a story of like just insane levels of success in like a very short time so basically we we got into games last november and since then we've done like all, almost four billion dollars in transaction volume across our platform uh you know we're, we're like we work with a lot of games we play a lot of blockchain games like you know we have we just have a we're like we're immersed in like blockchain gaming day, day and night right um and I think the thing that's really missing over here is that people who are creating, the, you know, the teams and the, and the people who are creating these games, they're not really willing to give up control of their of their creative vision to their communities, and that's that's sort of like what's getting in the way of most blockchain games is sort of this uh, hesitance, hesitant like hesitation from the from the projects to like sort of give up control to their communities. Um, and it's difficult to give up control to a community. So like, you know, one thing that we're sort of seeing a reaction to is uh, a reaction against is play to earn, uh, you know, sort of uh, people have started criticizing, like, like, you know, I was at NFT NYC a few weeks ago and like everybody was saying like, yeah, you know, we knew like play to earn was going to die like, you know, like last year, like, you know, there was no way it was sustainable. But actually, it was never that clear, right? Like, uh, it was never that clear. And it's still not clear to me that, like, Step N is unsustainable. For me, like, for example, if you look at something like Step N, uh, it's generous to call it a game. I don't think, like, Step N is really a game. Uh, but it's entertaining. People people like to play it. It like, gets people to walk or whatever, right? Uh, but step something like Step N, it's not, like, you know, it's not an example of Ponzi-nomics, in my opinion, because they have external behavior that people are rewarded for in game and as soon as you have that external behavior you actually have a connection to external value 
um, for example, Stepn could monetize the steps data that it's collecting right off of all of its users and give them a share of like that revenue. There's there's so many things that they could do to turn that into a that they have the option of doing. I don't know what the right cho choice is for them uh, to turn that into a sustainable economy that like, you know, it's not clear that there's for me, it's not that the writings on the wall, but like play to earn or anything like that play to earn probably will remain a viable model for like a fraction of games like, you know, it perpetually, right? In, indefinitely, there will always be play to earn games. That's, that's not that's not a genre that's going to like magically disappear because like we're in crypto winter now or something like that, right? Um, but the, you know, the, the thing about it is that because during the bull during the bull run, uh, play to earn was sort of like the dominant narrative amongst games. So everybody like, you know, most white papers were like, you know, you take the Axie white paper, you sort of copy paste it, you change some part of the economy to like, you know, make it sustainable or whatever. And then like, you know, you launch it and then you raise like $10 million and like, you know, blah, 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 everything is great. Um, that's going away and people are starting to experiment more with like the game mechanics and economic models. And like, actually that's a very positive thing. So. Uh, we're only starting to see that level of experimentation right now. And I think we need to have a lot more of that kind of experimentation before we actually find like, you know, a number of things that will work in building blockchain games. So, um, you know, I think it's just a matter of time and experimentation and like, you know, the natural course of human activity before we find something. And uh, right now people are just presented with a choice, right? You can either like stand by and watch on the sidelines or you can participate. And uh, there's no guarantee of success for participating, but there's definitely a guarantee of not you know being part of this future if you if you act as a bystander now and so uh i just urge people who like games to participate <laughs> uh even though like the the gaming community like you know not not the blockchain gaming community but like you know the people who play games just the community of gamers is quite skeptical of web3 uh, and i sort of understand why um but even so for me the potential of this is so large that like you know even if there's a lot of noise and even if there are a lot of scams and like even if there's a lot of like very insincere behavior uh that doesn't mean that there aren't people who are like you know genuinely trying to like you know explore something or explore like some really great exciting potential over here and uh and you know everyone has the option has the opportunity to be one of those people which is super exciting to me uh nothing can stop you this, this that's the great thing about like web3 nobody can stop you literally nobody can stop you it's 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 amazing i, I don't want to swear but i'm sorry i won't swear on the podcast but like you know it's amazing <laughs> well feel free to swear because okay, okay. you know, we're, we're all adults here yeah. uh, but i totally agree and it's very refreshing to hear that extremely smart and talented people such as yourself share this sort of vision because i think about this stuff many 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 times a yeah. day and I mean, I'm obsessed. I can't not be obsessed. It's just too much fun and too exciting. And I, I, I share a hope that what you just said comes true in that people at least participate and give it a shot and stick around and dip a toe in, see what yeah. happens. Yeah. I now I bet once you do dip a toe in, you're not going to want to get out. You're going to yeah. jump. You're going to jump all in sooner or later. But at least dip the toe to, to have the experience. Give yourself a chance to participate in in a coming wave, whether whether you think it's a fad or not. Just try it. See, uh, see form your happens. own opinion. Don't accept someone else's word for it. I think that's the most exactly. important thing is form your own opinion because yeah. um, only by thinking about it yourself and like trying to understand it yourself and it's worth, and the reason it's worth, like, you know, it's, it's difficult to form your own opinion about things. Like it, it takes effort and it takes time to like, you know, learn like, and with the with blockchain, there's a lot to learn, right? It's like, it's really, I, I think it's genuinely difficult to form your own opinion about this stuff, but um the potential is so great over here i mean you have you you only have, like you know anyone listening only has our words for it but uh like really i can't uh, sort of emphasize this strongly enough the potential is so great over here you know before this the kinds of things that blockchain games are concerned with the kinds of like ideas and um uh the kinds of like structures that blockchain games are concerned with were solely the purview of religions and governments and now all of a sudden you know regular people can start experimenting with the same ideas and the same structures that's a very powerful thing i mean and and it's hard to quantify why that's that, why that's such a powerful thing but like for me it, personally it's just so exciting that like you know we can think through and we can understand the reasons that like our governments and our religions work the way that they do and we can question some of the premises under which they're founded and we can actually like 
see if those premises are necessary or we can see if there are any variations on those premises that can lead to better like you know arrangements of like society or arrangements of people like that's so exciting we've never been able to do that before um you know that's mind-blowing to me it's just it's just something that's power that yeah. that's real power yeah. is the ability to question and understand and and to be able to ask a question that you could never ask before of a dominant something that has been dominant for thousands of years at a minimum yeah that's huge that's huge and, I'm really and, and then being able to experiment with like you know what would it look like if it worked this way instead and then you can deploy a smart contract you can deploy an economy onto a blockchain and you can actually sort of play it out you can roll it out you know like that's that's mind-blowing that's so amazing uh and it's just i don't know i'm so excited about it <laughs> it's just... me too me too it's almost like and the starcraft players will get this reference it's almost like discovering banelings for the first time and realizing what you can do with them and then going all in on that strat and just send you know full send yeah and seeing what happens or, or learning how to use spellcasters properly like learning how to use it <laughs> correctly or learning how to use, you know, yeah it's it's or learning how to use code correctly if you play terran right uh right. like those units are incredibly powerful i, I guess we're getting too starcraft intensive is <laughs> But uh, they're hard to control. But once you learn how to control them well, uh, you sort of unlock the next year of like skill uh, in the game. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, and I think to just bring it back, it's, it's like discovering this really interesting machine that has incredible power and there is a learning curve. And you need to, you need to get through that initial, how do I even operate this machine? But then once you do, and once you, once you do cross that learning curve, then really the opportunities are endless. I mean, yeah. it, it's like the first time you picked up a smartphone, you probably didn't know exactly what to do with it. But then once you tinkered with it for a bit, you got it. And then you realize that this thing's going to change the world. It's yeah. it's like the very early stages of that. Um, so I'm glad that we I'm glad that we got to this point. Um, I don't want to I don't want to keep you too long. I know that we're already kind of past our, our stated uh, objective time wise. So. Um, I just really want to ask you one last question is what's the most important thing people can do right now in order to prepare for what's coming in the future? Learn, pick a blockchain, set up an account on that blockchain, figure out how to get money onto that blockchain, choose some project that sounds interesting to you and just participate. I think that's like, that's the best thing that you can do right now you don't have to spend like thousands of dollars or whatever, right? Like just start small, but just sort of get some sort of a feel for how this technology works, because, you know, it's not clear right now. I will, even though I work in crypto, even though like, you know, I build in crypto, I will say this, it's not clear to me that like, you know, crypto is going to survive or be huge. Like let's say 20 or 30 years from now. Okay. A lot of things can happen from now to then. And, uh, and the governments of the world, many governments of the world are going to try and shut it down. And, you know, it's not clear whether they're going to be successful or not. Okay. But think of this as a moonshot, right? If it's, if it does survive, it's going to be huge and it's going to change the way that like our societies are structured and, and, and just the way that we interact with like our fellow human beings and the way, even it's going to change the way that like the way that we think about value, the thing, the way that we think about money, the way that we earn money, all of these things are going to change if these ideas survive, uh, for a long enough amount of time. And so just even a small investment of time and effort to just understand how the technology works um, is time well spent. Uh, and it's it's worth investigation. It's worth spending a little bit of time and a little bit of thought on. And so I just urge anyone to do that if they haven't done it already. Well, I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. I know you're a very busy man doing incredible things. And uh, I just want to say thank you for building. Thank you for helping to create this future that we're all going to enjoy tremendously. And uh, maybe we could do this again in the future. Thanks. Thanks for having me on, Ben. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. And to everybody watching and listening, thank you all very much. I love you all. Do not be afraid of crypto. Jump in, explore, have fun. Have fun. This is gaming. We're, we're all supposed to have fun. So dive in. It's going to be a ton of fun, I promise. And I will see you all on the other side.